You're watching Beyond Markets. Welcome, I'm Esther Awuni. On the show today, we'll be assessing the role of blockchain technology in the future of financial services. As always, you can join the conversation with the hashtag Beyond Markets, and you can follow my Twitter handle too, at Esther O. Awuni. Now, what is the role of blockchain technology and cryptocurrencies in the future of financial services? Well, to discuss this, my guests are Philip Jarman, Chief Operating Officer and UK Director of Sesso Global, and Bolaji Onibude, he's the CEO of Zenbit Dex, they're here to discuss that with us. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Pleasure Hello. to have you on the show today. Now, obviously, it would appear that cryptocurrencies are here to stay, you know, supported by the, the blockchain technology. But Bolaji, let me start with you in terms of how widespread it is in, in Africa and how it's being deployed. Um, actually, cryptocurrencies are now totally wide, widespread across Africa. We've seen a lot of activities in South Africa, Kenya, Ghana, and Nigeria. Those are the big markets, really. Um, while they are uh, both formal and informal activities, in, on the formal side, some of the companies leading these activities are foreign companies. These include companies such as Paxful, um, Luno, uh, and Remitano. This Companies are basically exchanges that provide exchange services for buyers and sellers to come on board and make trades on crypto assets or what you would normally regard as Bitcoin, Bitcoin yeah. Ethereum and so on and so forth. But then there's also the black market which is uh, a, uh, a lot of groups of informal um, traders who come together over WhatsApp, Telegraph and, and other social media platforms to enable trades between one another. Two trusts, they trust each other, they come together. Uh, usually there's somebody who asks as an escrow mm. to ensure that people who come to uh, on these uh, groups are trusted individuals. Basically there's somebody who knows where they live, uh, whether they uh, where they walk and so on before they can come on board. Okay, so if we're talking about the, the, the value of the market, if if that is talked about, does it would it capture the, this segment of the market too? Informally, in terms of I'll say no. Volumes uh, and, okay. uh, uh, PwC actually suggested uh, a few months ago that in Nigeria uh, we were doing about two billion weekly, uh, two billion naira weekly, but that's the formal. Uh, okay. side of the market. Okay. But informal side, I think it's actually way bigger than that. Now, Philip, now, I mean, at first we had that cryptocurrency, the, the big buzz when, you know, we saw Bitcoin yeah. reaching phenomenal highs, but then we had that, I mean, that major pullback, and it looks like, it, you know, it, things seem to have normalized now, but in terms of its reach and widespread and, and acceptability, uh, it's still, you know, it's still uh, a currency to pay attention to. What are your thoughts in terms of how uh, perhaps uh, uh, globally outside of Africa, how it's catching on and how what lessons we may be learning in Africa as you know it begins yeah. to gain more momentum. I, mean, I think banks are still very wary of, of it as an asset class, whether it's an asset or whether it's cash. I think the, um, the spike in the price we saw over January, uh, December and January was partly to do with institutional investors coming in and really spiking up the, you know, spiking mm -hmm. up the price. Central banks have an issue with it because obviously they can't determine um, uh, price because of you know interest rate controls. The power of it really exists in the peer in the ability peer to peer. So if I owed um, Balaji some money, I could directly send it from my wallet to Balaji's. That massively reduces the cost of the transaction. So um, you know this is something that. So so for example, I think that most people sending money from the UK, for example, from the UK UK to Africa, are, are around they're mostly sub two hundred dollars a day. They're paying around twelve point eight percent margin on that transaction yeah. with a with a wallet it's very very small it's negligible 0 0.00 you know percent in many instances as an asset class i think it's interesting you've clearly got to keep a you know an eye on it the price has um reduced in volatility this is and i'm specifically talking about bitcoin, bitcoin here Bitcoin, yes um in terms of ethereum ether the currency really um is now uh, um is now again got uh, receded from the highs of around you know, four, four fifty. What will happen in the future? Maybe you won't have a, have as much volatility. The Chinese are certainly very wary mm. about you know um, coming in coming in on the regulatory side and you know and ICOs. And I'm thinking, I mean, that's where one of the biggest worries lie. The regulators are still super nervous about it and how it's going to pr progress, especially in the future. So I'm just wondering, how do we know, begin to forecast and see this is what are the shape that cryptocurrencies will take in the future and the role 
uh, how the, the role of the currency, <coughs> excuse me, how the role of the currency will evolve in the future, especially within the financial services. Balaji, your thoughts on that? So uh, actually, it's a good thing that regulators are paying attention to it. So this ensures that they filter out the bad guys, you know, the money launderers, the terrorist funders, and so on. Uh, and they're beginning to endorse this globally. So for instance, in the US, the Security and Exchange Commission now sees uh, tokens, which, which are initial coin offering tokens, as valid. Okay. As long as you know the companies issuing those tokens are registered and meet all the guidelines and requirements, which are quite similar to the uh, IPOs, uh, okay. initial public offerings. So it's a good thing, and, and that's, that's making uh, US become a preferred destination for people to do initial coin offering, or sort of like a, a crowd fund, which allows startup companies to raise uh, tens of millions of dollars very quickly within a space of a month or two. Mm. But is that, is that happening here in Africa? Yes, uh, a few, a couple of Nigerian companies have also successfully raised uh, money. Uh, there was a company called uh, Shore Remit, which raised mm. about $7 million uh, last year uh, in the fourth quarter. Uh, so uh, a company in Zimbabwe, Golix, also just raised uh, about $32 million, according to uh, Found ICO. Um, uh, which is um, basically an ICO rating uh, agency online. So a, a few other companies are looking at that. Even uh, some, some Nigerian companies are also currently looking to do that, Kenyans and so on in South Africa. So they, they've been, uh, it's been becoming an alternative way of raising funds uh, <coughs> Now, Philip, do you, do you think that the regulators here also, I mean, just as nervous, and do you think they're perhaps uh, keeping a closer eye on how this in, it evolves. I know yeah. that, I mean, blockchain, the technology that supports it, that's also being deployed. I mean, yeah. here in Nigeria, the custom service have already adopted Indeed. it for the exit. Yes. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, look, obviously, they're. Yeah, I mean, typically, innovation always goes quicker than the regulator, right? Because they're trying to sort of, you know, um, push the margins and everything. Um, clearly, um, from, a, from a Nigerian perspective, the regulator needs to keep a, you know, needs to keep an eye on it. On the ICO side, I see the, the ICOs being a real viable alternative for early stage um, tech startups to raise funding because at an early stage, it's very, very difficult. Um, in other parts of the world, it's very difficult here to raise funding. So th th these initial coin offerings are viable alternatives to going to angels or even institutional investors to try and raise funds for your, you know, for your venture. Mm. Um, so the, you have on the one side the regulator wanting to try and control it, on the other side um, business models needing cash, needing liquidity, using these instruments to, to try and um, you know, uh, develop their, technolo their technology and their markets. Well I'm just thinking for the initial coin offering, uh, how, do you see this, how do you see it evolving and uh, I know that uh, according to a note that you put out, apart from the initial coin offering, other token based initiatives, you, I mean you give the impression that it's not in terms of the impact it could have here, uh, we may not be getting it right right now. Yes, uh, it's the early days. The, there was a city in uh, California, uh, I believe San Jose, uh, did uh, an initial community offering, which was basically raising something similar to uh, a bond to allow them um, raise funds for a project, for an infrastructure project. Uh, we just saw uh, a week ago, the World Bank actually issued a bond on the blockchain. Uh, so this, these are the sort of activities that are going to con continue to happen. And if you look at Africa, for instance, we have issues with infrastructure, power, and numerous other um, uh, sectors that could actually benefit from whether it's an ICO, uh, an initial um, community offering, or state offering, or w whatever the the um, the opportunity presents. Okay. Uh, so it, we could begin to see how we could fund infrastructure. For instance, we've talked mm. about the fourth Milan Bridge for over a decade. Now. How would that work? I mean, you typically. Know, well, give us a, give it's, us a scenario. It's, it's, you know, would you, you would obviously uh, be willing to let, uh, it's basically letting the private sector come in uh, at a larger scale. We're oh. not just uh, looking to inviting investors coming in physically at, uh, uh, you know, a trade show or um, an investment conference. It's now reaching out to the world, uh, visiting numerous conferences globally. 
where you find initial coin offering investors, uh, mm -hmm. people who are often regarded as whales, who have made tremendous whales. amount of money uh, from the uh, crypto assets. You know, I'm talking about people who spend as little as a thousand dollars or ten thousand uh, dollars about six, seven years ago, and now that money is worth you know hundreds of millions mm -hmm. of dollars. Now, Philip, would you like to add to that? I mean, in terms of how, I mean, the initial coin offering, but then, of course, funding bigger, way bigger projects. Yeah, I think it, it the, I mean, I'm a, I would be a huge fan of the private sector coming in and, and wanting to fund. Maybe they can keep an eye on, um, on, how, on how the money is spent. And it's, maybe this leads into the fact that the technology that underpins cryptocurrency blockchain also enables individuals to track how the money is spent. And while there's a huge amount of interest in the uh, liquidity in the crypto ICO space, um, an another strength of the technology is on the distributed ledger technology side, which is uh, ultimately notarizing documents that are essential for a transaction. And that's, you know, that's what we do. So not only is there an opportunity to raise private finance for large infrastructure projects, but you can then track the way that money is spent so that you have no, you know, no leakage, and that's what private sector people want. They want returns. And of course, the issue of trust. I know that. I mean, when it yeah. comes to blockchain, what one of the biggest selling points uh, is definitely trust. Yeah. Uh, we have, uh, I think, about two minutes uh, to break. Let okay, what, just one minute before we take a break. About let just let's just quickly talk about Zenbit. Uh, I know that before now, according to your, your note, you oper operated a centralized exchange, and that has been that well, that has been prone to some security challenges as well, but you're decentralizing things. Quickly tell us about that. Yes, so for the um, cryptocurrency exchanges, they've been centralized, uh, which which means they've been following the uh, centralized norm w okay. in regards to stock exchanges and central banks and so on and so forth. But then we're beginning to see issues around theft, hacking, and so on. Uh, one of um, uh, the more famous um, uh, uh, ICO investor Ian Ballinan, for instance, his account was hacked on some of the major uh, exchanges where he lost about two million dollars, and so many other people uh, in the space are losing money. And and a lot of the big exchanges are now be beginning to uh, look at decentralization to make sure that they become more secure, so that they do not lose. Uh, people's funds, so basically become non-custodian, which is really the true sense of blockchain uh, okay. and decentralized. I'm interested ledger. in learning more about that. We'll just take a quick break and we'll come back and pick up from where we left off. I've been speaking to Philip Jarman, Chief Operating Officer and UK Director of Sesso Global and Bolaji Onibudu, CEO of Zembit Dex. So we're continuing our focus on the future of blockchain. Still with me is Philip Jarman. He's a Chief Operating Officer and UK Director of Sesso Global. And of course, Bolaji Onibudu, CEO of Zembit Dex. Now, gentlemen, thank you so much for your thank time you. so far. Let's let's uh, spread this out now. Seso Global, yes. uh, Philip, let's talk about that. Uh, it's a digital lands transaction flat platform. Quite interesting how uh, this is also being used to help sort out land issues. Talk to us yeah, about that. Yes, so the problem that we're trying to solve is um, trust within the property mm -hmm. transaction process. So um, you may drive around Accra, you may drive around Lagos, and on the side of the walls you see this land is not for sale. That's not an effective way to protect your protect your property. So the, the way that we use the blockchain is in um, hashing certain essential documents that are required in order for a transaction to occur and ownership to to pass over to a new owner. Okay. So within our within our ecosystem, we work with um, property developers, entities who want to sell properties, and banks banks who want to issue mortgages against those properties. In the middle, we have what we call land service providers who further check and consolidate the data on the ownership because the banks want to answer two, one, two questions. Who owns the asset and is there any existing lending against the asset? So it's a data filtration process as you, as you work through the transaction. But blockchain can be, and that's the way that we're using it, to, uh, to hash essential documents that are required for ownership to, to transfer between person A to person B. What if there's litigation on that on a certain land and maybe that wasn't known or families are fighting over the land and there's been this very long history of dispute yeah. and I don't know because I, I see we see that happening especially here in Nigeria yeah, absolutely. Here in Lagos. so how do you get around that? It's a really good question and um, we get asked this question a lot. We are um, originally working with um, property developers so these are brand new properties properties have, that, that don't have any transaction uh, history um, why? Because we can establish ownership uh, a lot quicker. 
Once we've uh, managed to capture that part of the market, we can then uh, move on to properties that have had a couple of transactions. But we're aware that, that ownership can be in dispute, there can be legal issues. We want to work towards a point where we can solve those, those issues so, so properties can, tra can transfer with ease. Mm. Um, in order to get to that point, we need to capture the, you know, the properties that, that have clean data. So, um, you know, it's, it, it's, a, it's a rollout process. It's very much a strategy we have in order to capture more of the market. Well, as you were talking earlier about, I mean, security risks and, I mean, moving from a centralised to a decentralised uh, system. And obviously, I, I assume that that will be a safer route that's decentralised in the system. Tell us more about that. Yes, certainly. Um, Zenbase basically is a decentralised exchange uh, because we look to the risk, the issues and risk associated with uh, centralized exchange services. Uh, for instance, it's very easy for me to hack an account if I am close to you and I know perhaps the likely f four or five people you call every day, I can do a SIM, SIM swap on MTN or which, whichever of the networks you're on. And immediately I can go to Google and say, I've forgotten my password and they're going to send me a code right to your to, to your number, which is what I now have, and immediately I can get into your email account, begin to see uh, whether it's one of the big exchanges like Polynex, Kraken, based in Japan, uh, or, or Bitpanda, and then send an email over there or try to log in over there and say, I, I've lost my password, and immediately they send me an activation code, and bang, I'm in your account. And I'm able to see what sort of assets you see and, and sell them. But with decentralized exchange, the keys which hold your assets actually sits with you, either on your device, your phone, or your computer. And even if you like, you can write it down on paper and keep it somewhere safe or in a safety deposit uh, somewhere with one of these institutions. So decentralization, which was introduced by blockchain, ensures that control of your assets is in your hands. So Zenbit, therefore, is non-custodian. We do not hold assets of our customers. Now, Philip, I mean, when you hear, I mean, hearing about that and the fact that I mean, it's safer, but do you think that perhaps there could still be challenges, perhaps that we're not uh, aware of now that could crop up? still relating to the issue of security yeah and so trust. I mean there, there are different types of blockchains there are public blockchains and, there are, and private permissioned blockchains um, I we work because of who our stakeholders are property developers and banks yeah. um, we would have a difficult time trying to sell them a solution that relied on a, pub, a public blockchain so the integrity of the transactions are guaranteed by external developers programmers wanting to process a transaction in order to, to receive Bitcoin or Ether, for example. So we what call we use what's called a private permission chain. So every, so you you need to have, um, you need to be have a permission in order to get into the transaction. Plus, and I don't want to get too technical because it can um, people can sort of zone out, right? But um, <laughs> each entity within our transaction has okay. what's called different permissions. So they they can um, they they base their decision on on um, on data that they are allowed to see that they are allowed to process that other entities to the transaction don't get to see so the motivate and that's driven by motivation so a seller's motivation is to sell the property they have a different motivation from the bank and that's the base of their different permissions um, you know I would argue that private permission chains are you know are a lot safer um, but look every every system is prone to to hacking what we're trying to move away from is a paper-based system where you have a centralized database, let's say a land registry, that is um, where, paper, where paper records can get lost, stolen or destroyed. If you have it on a decentralized basis, the data is digitalized and it's held amongst those um, within, the, within the, the ecosystem with the transaction. I mean, in terms of I mean, adoption rates, you, are you expecting this to, get, I mean, to be adopted across the continent going forward? If I mean, you're able to sort out some of the issues and make it more... Uh, put it across people in such a way that they know that, I mean, there are obviously be significant benefits. Yeah, absolutely. So what we always say is um, all of the important stakeholders to a transaction keep their data. Mm. We don't have the data. They, they can keep the data. Huge advantages in the data analytics side, you know, um, what you can look into, how you can monetize, you know, monetize mm. the data. Um, banks want to make money. So do property developers. And they, banks don't want to lend because um, they don't trust the properties that they're lending to. Remember, who owns the asset existing lending against the asset? Those are the two, the, uh, the two questions. 
if they're presented with a process that the where they, whereby they can lend with confidence, with trust, mm -hmm. they're certainly prepared to you know to have a look at it. So our conversations with banks have so far been hugely positive. They want to have a look at the platform and see how it works. Because one other thing, what there is a finite point with which you can reduce costs. That's what blockchain can do, distributed ledger can do. That's not enough to bring um, entities on board. You also need to generate revenue. No, and that's what absolutely. our platform does. Um, property developers can sell, generate revenue. Banks can lend, generate revenue. And obviously the um, uh, selling isn't finite. It's potentially, in, in theory, absolutely, it's infinite. Abs absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll back to the I mean, exchanges. I was just re I'm reading part of the note that you put out uh, where you talked about accessibility being a challenge as most exchanges are developed for the elite. Yes, um, often, um, you know, exchanges want you to send uh, information about your U.S. dollar domiciliary account to them, like Kraken. When I registered with Kraken last year, I had to send various documents uh, to them for them to verify who I was. Uh, but here we have in Nigeria, we have people who earn maybe less than a million now who don't earn so many dollars and don't have uh, dollar accounts that do trading every day. And they do that like over the counter with other uh, traders. Uh, we want to be able to provide a service for them through um, a highly secured wallet, a Zenbit wallet, which will run in a trusted execution environment based on a tr technology introduced to us by Trustonic. So essentially we'll make the wallet a highly secure wallet, mm -hmm. perhaps one of the more secure wallets uh, globally. And then you'll also be able to trade, uh, meaning that you're in control of your assets, but through peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, enabled by the uh, blockchain, you'll be able to trade with other people that might have placed sell orders on the order books, or they might have paid buy orders on, on the order book. So we also have a matching engine that will put this together and make things work more rapidly. Uh, the matching engine, of course, will be uh, a centralized feature okay. which puts uh, people together. I mean, looking down the line into the future, 10, 15 years from now, how do you see your services evolving? and also matching, of course, your clients' needs. So as uh, you begin to see more tokenization, uh, you speak of uh, uh, the customs um, excise trade management uh, project, which uh, 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 just got concluded, the pilot got concluded earlier this year. I was actually involved with that uh, project. Uh, and uh, we had used the Oracle uh, Hyperledger variant uh, called the Oracle blockchain as a service. Uh, we begin to see how uh, assets such as licenses, permits from the government uh, uh, become uh, you know, entities that you could trade. Uh, if you wanted to, for instance, uh, sell a company uh, that had such assets uh, to license as a manufacturer or to, to do uh, mining or any other sort of so exploration. So this could easily become a norm? Yes, using the, the, yes, the blockchain. yes. Because I yeah. remember asking, I had the guy from the customs here and asked him, about, uh, I mean, how they're hoping that they could perhaps uh, put all all their systems or processes mm -hmm. you know, under the blockchain. And he said, well, they, they are also having talks to see how that, that can happen. And of course, across the sectors here in Nigeria, speaking about Nigeria, there's also the potential, the possibility of that happening. Do you, do you see that happening? Philip? Yeah, I mean, there are, there are challenges. And in order for you to create a viable ecosystem, you need this, all your stakeholders involved. You think there's a, is there a broad acceptability and understanding of how it works and the benefits that come with it? I th yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, look, I mean, I always refer back to, to our case, which is um, property ownership. Um, there's a wonderful book by the economist Hernando de Soto, The Mystery of Capital, who wrote about um, un, uh, trapped capital. You know, in Nigeria, you have a lot of trapped capital that can be, if it's secured, it can be released, home equity releases, people can use it to develop their businesses. There's a huge upside to securing property as an asset class. So you can, you know, you more readily pass on to your children, less, um, less legal costs when it comes to, you know, to disputes and things like that. That's ultimately the benefit from a, ta governments can also extract greater taxation if they know when properties are transacting, there's stamp duty, et cetera, property usage commercial um, residential real estate is being used for commercial purposes so these are the these are the huge societal impacts that technology does um, does offer yeah. greater transparency I mean we were talking before the, the the advantage with greater transparency in the mortgage space means that you're reducing your cost of capital which means you're, it could potentially have positive effects okay. on interest rates they reduce okay All so right. huge impacts right. we're gonna have to leave it there thank you so much gentlemen thank you Philip thank you Balaji it's been a great
have, have had a great time talking to you today. Thank you very that much. That was Thank Philip German, Chief Operating Officer, UK Director of Seso Global, and Bolaji Onibudo, CEO, Digital Transaction Services.